Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The readings for the second Sunday of Easter, which falls on April 16th, 2023. Our first reading is Acts chapter 2, verses 14a, and then reading verses 22 through 32. The psalm is 16. Our second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And our gospel this Sunday will be John 20, verses 19 through 31 familiar text and as we continue now in this post-resurrection season and talk in light of the rumors of the resurrection. Ooh, that sounded like something you wanted to talk about there, Joy. Rumors of the resurrection. What do you have in mind there? I just, I just, um, I love, I love the fact that what's really happening in all of these narratives are the things that happen um, no longer with the promise and expectations, or I should say all the promises and expectations of what the Messiah would mean or what Jesus, their new teacher was going to do have been shattered. And there's, um, the, the, everything is totally turned upside down, as you said na last week. It's a cosmic transformation. And what does that mean? And uh, so um, everything is in light of the rumors of the resurrection. And in, for this particular text, uh, which is uh, so often um, we um, read this text and um, we, we spend our time um, um, we spend our time with the fear, we spend our time with the promise of peace, and yet that was what they thought they were getting all along, right? Uh, they, they, they thought that the coming of the Messiah would mean peace. They thought having this particular rabbi who taught like no other would, would give them something that they long, uh, that their generations had long learned for, or long, that, that's going to that I can't say that had long longed for. <laughs> had for long time. I can't say it without using the word long. Um, but uh, you know what I'm trying to say. They've been wanting this for quite some time. I work with words. I can pull something out here. And yet the power of this is the repetition that the peace of Jesus is with us. And so Jesus shows up, shows them in the midst of their fear behind locked doors. Um, shows them um, that their peace is a confidence. And then we've, we, we focus on, on Thomas in a way that is sometimes, and I appreciate the, um, um, the, the commentary for this, we focus uh, uh, too often on, on Thomas in a negative sense. And if you just heard that someone who was publicly lynched is hanging around and being encountered again in the same um, I've got to talk about, I've seen the Lord that was experienced for three years when Jesus was in ministry. Um, in some ways, what Thomas is doing is what everybody else was doing when the crowds came to see Jesus, when they brought all that were in need of healing uh, to see Jesus. Thomas says, I want to see him too. I want that same experience that others have spoken of having. In this, in this case, my friends who were gathered together and I wasn't with them. And in many ways, that's what we're asking for. We're still hearing the rumors of the resurrection 2,000 years old, or later, and we want Jesus to show up. And so one of the things that I highlighted um, is uh, first a question. Um, did you mean what you asked for? because that's what Thomas did. Thomas gets specific. This is what I need. And then it takes time. A week later, and here we are 2,000 years later, what did we, whether it's our collective community, denomination, uh, people, family, church, what did we ask for as proof that the peace of Christ would be among us? And when it showed up, did we notice it? And did we follow up on our side of the bargain? Because Thomas's response is to say that you are indeed my Lord and my God. 
So yeah, I had a little something about that. Thanks for <laughs> well, you had mentioned it last week. So the you know there I heard a rumor that you were interested in rumors. So I <laughs> wanted wanted to follow up with that. Yeah, I I think too that this story often gets misinterpreted that Thomas is asking for proof, and that's not the case at all. And that he he wants, as you said, Joy, what what everybody else is. (laughs) He has to have his own experience. He has to have his own encounter. And that's something that I think is really a gift of this passage, according to John, in that the resurrected Christ will find you and meet you wherever you are. He finds Mary in the garden. He finds Thomas. He finds the disciples, even though the doors are locked. Uh, And he finds Thomas. And then in the next resurrection uh, appearance in John, he'll find Peter and the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And so that that in and of itself, I think, is a homiletical direction is to say that resurrected Christ will meet you where you are and meet you where you are in your in your believing, in your in your wherever yeah. your yeah, wherever your experience is. And that's I think that's uh, a, a beautiful resurrection sermon. So what do we do with the whole offering, you know, of his body in this way? The, you know, here I am. If you want, you can put your hand on my side. Um, and you know, Thomas is that never says that Thomas does that. Never says that that's what he really needs. But for Jesus to offer that mm-hmm. is uh, a gross. <laughs> B. Um, potentially strange and awkward for everybody else in the room mm-hmm. uh but see also like really 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 self-giving um in a very literal sense there I'll, I'll go back to talking about art it's fascinating to me how a lot of artists represent this where everybody's looking over thomas's shoulder right like <laughs> like look 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 you know and it's a it's a it's a public it's a group experience so to speak there are also some where you only see thomas and jesus together it, which shrinks the scene makes it very individualized no, the rest of the room fades away this is only about these two and I, I honestly don't know what to make of it i mean i um we could we could talk more i, I guess more sacramentally and talk about Jesus's body and what does it mean to encounter that body in the various ways we do that that to be honest it doesn't always theology doesn't always work for me or I don't find that as compelling as other ways of, of talking about it but I know for some of our listeners it's it's more important I haven't really said anything except just to ask a question like what do we make of this because it is it is strange but it's it's strangely intimate and by intimate I mean like disarming. Mm-hmm. I'm not letting anybody touch wounds in my body except for a doctor who's trying to get rid of them, you know, and there's something about that that's beautiful in its strangeness to me. But I love that, Matt. Um, and and I, I'm struck because uh, um, when I live in, in a stereotyped world, um, Father, forgive me for I sin. Um, but when I lived in a stere- st- li- when I live in a stereotype world, I kind of think of guys sitting around saying, "Let me show you my wound. Let me show you my scar. Let me show you how you know th- this is from when you know I had stitches when I was eight, and this is when I you know broke my leg on the football field." And 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 so on one level, um, for me, it's kind of uh, uh, less gross. And 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 more a, a kind of uh, guys can get into this too after we've had all of these women stories, um, which are are so prominent as, <laughs> as the opening of the resurrection story. The women are the first to be there. The women are the first to carry the news. But guys, you can get into this too in the way that you like to do it. <laughs> This is the bro scene. I think that's also <laughs> true for chapter twenty one when <laughs> yeah. Peter takes off his clothes or puts his clothes back on. Yeah. There they go. But Jesus and the bros. <laughs> but then there's the other uh, kind of um, um, Greek culture, a uh, Hellenistic culture, where one of the philosophies really um, uh, is anti-body, and so uh, and and how um, 
the Christians uh, early Christians kind of adopted this sense of it's more, and later Christians too, it's more about the soul. It's more about the afterlife. It's more about the spirit. And, and so I love this particular scene because it's like, no, Jesus walked around in a sweaty, smelly body. And the resurrection was the return of that physical body. It wasn't just some hope-filled idea in a world where body bad, spirit good. But no, we're going to bring this forward and say the God who labored over a lump of clay and donated dignity to dirt is still believing in this physical incarnation, even after uh, uh, this body has been lynched. And so the value of the body and the story that it tells, scars and all, I think I see in this story. Thanks for that question. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Uh, yeah, I think where this these this detail becomes really important overall for John is the way in which the the reminder in a very visible, gross <laughs> reminder of the incarnation is in the midst of of the glory of the resurrection. So John 1 14 and the word became flesh. And it's, it's, if one is a careful reader of John, one recognizes that it just as soon as you want to make Jesus fully the I am or fully the, you know, the glory of the resurrection, that, that the reality of the incarnation just comes right in and, and, and pulls that rug right out from under you. And, so it is a, I think it's an important theological, I don't know how much this preaches, but it's an important theological moment in John to hold both of these together, that uh, this is, this is, this resurrected body is the incarnated God. And so those details of the wounds uh, is, uh, I think, an affirmation of that incarnations and we can't, and we can't forget that. And so yeah, I, it's 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 really an important um, moment, and not only because of a response to what Tom, Thomas needs, but and or what he think he, what what he thinks he needs, but it is it is that uh, affirmation of you know the word became flesh, and this is what happens to flesh, <laughs> this is what happens to the incarnation, this is what happens to bodies, and. And none of that can, God can escape, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that I think underscoring of that is really key here. I mean, another, another, and then we should uh, probably go on, but another thing that I wanted to mention, I will often use verse 30 and 31 in a way to help uh, particularly our our beginning preacher's joy to recognize that the these words that you know the, these accounts and and especially here the account of the resurrection is not for your information and it's not to uh, confirm some sort of creedal doctrinal beliefs. Oh yes, I believe in the resurrection, uh, but it it is for the sake of your own relationship with Jesus and with God so that these are written so that you might come to believe. And then there's other, uh, I won't get into the text critical variants because that doesn't preach, but, uh, but that there's equal manuscript evidence that this is either an error subjunctive or a present subjunctive. Come to believe, meaning you haven't believed before, you haven't been in a relationship with Jesus before, and then continue to believe. Of course, the people who are listening are the continue to believe ones, but it's believing is always a verb in John. And so these stories are, are written and we hear these stories so that we are nurtured and sustained in our in our believing. And I think that maybe that's a, a homiletical point too, is that the resurrection is not about, it's not about believing in a certain doctrine of the resurrection as it is, 
as it is how this resurrection appearance is provides sustenance for that ongoing relationship with Jesus. So that's something too I would want to hold up. I really, I really appreciate you reminding uh, us of that, and it's it's powerful um, as we teach together for you to convey that to the students uh, as as just a a platform uh, for uh, all sermon preparation for all the stories that we tell. Why are we doing this? That you might continue, that you might come to believe. Um, it, 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 shifting over um, uh, to Acts, um, and this is a thread back to um, Matt's question and my response to it, uh, uh, and, and your response to it as well, uh, Caroline, in terms of what it means that God took on flesh. The incarnation um, means that there's a physical reality to what we do to the idea of God. When, when, when Jesus took on flesh, what humanity did to the body of Jesus is what is being recounted here uh, by, by Peter. Uh, he, he's telling them, this is what you did to him. Uh, and uh, there's some reality to what we do to the ideas of God that transfer to what we did to the person of Jesus. And it transfers in light of... Um, what you were talking about last week, Matt, as we talked about the Acts text and its relevance um, for our contemporary society, I I'm just going to stretch that in, in a recognition of what we do to the icons of God, the flesh of God today, what we do to others to whom God has shown no partiality. And so the wounds that we inflict on one another are like the wounds we inflict on Jesus, and we bear the scars. Humanity, individuals, communities bear the scars of what others have done. And the question is, what story does the church tell about the intrusion of the life-giving peace of God made known in Jesus when we rehearse the reality of the trauma and the scars that we have inflicted on others? Again, that might just be a backdrop for how we tell the story of, of, of Thomas, but I think it's imp an important way to look at and read um, the specifics that Peter is rehearsing uh, in, 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 as recorded in, in Acts. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the sermon in Acts 2, and then this is again the first of three consecutive weeks where we'll have this same Pentecost sermon the part that people don't know because it follows the Joel text, which most people do know from, right. from Pentecost. But it's a it is a story about what to, to quote Peter, what you did <laughs> to the Messiah. It's a, and so the sermon begins with 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 accusation. Mm -hmm. And we'll see next week ends with repentance. And mm -hmm. we'll talk a lot about that. But uh, but it's, and there's a lot that goes on in between. It's a rather confusing sermon in some ways, but it, just to note, it does begin with uh, this Jesus, uh, you crucified and killed, verse 23. That's all one sentence up before that. Uh, and then it ends with, or at least this part of the sermon ends with this Jesus God raised up. And of that, we are all witnesses and witness is a key term in the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 1.8, you'll be my witnesses. This is, one of the things you can do with Acts during the Easter season is to talk about what are the various ways in which we bear witness to the risen Christ and what does that look like. And here, part of that has to do with repentance, part of that has to do with um, understanding our own complicity uh, in his death or in the rejection of, of God and of God's kingdom. And then the sermon goes on to talk a lot about God. It's another another uh, uh, like last week in Acts 10 it's another proclamation that describes God as an active agent in a lot of what's taking place here so everything is attributed to God right Jesus own ministry is attributed to God the resurrection of Jesus is attributed to God his own enduring authority is attributed to God which is a again that's a key aspect of Acts that Christ is now ascended not that means we know where to find him on a map 
but rather he now has God's authority over all creation, all history, all, all things. And that's a, a divine move. So that's part of what Christians do when we bear witness to a risen Christ is to talk about his, this is the wrong word, accessibility. <laughs> you, you know, his, I'm trying to use a word that's not overly theological, but you know, that his, his presence and, and that the way toward that, again, this is to in some ways anticipate next week, is through a repentance, which I'm sure I'll go on for way too long next week, isn't about moral contrition, isn't about, I'm sorry, I'll try to do better next time. It's about a new way of seeing the world, a new understanding of, of where God, who God is and where God is to be found and that God's claim on our lives. So, Yeah, I the that hinge or that that transition is uh between 23 and 24 i think is just really quite extraordinary it the english doesn't uh kind of it puts in a period at the end of 24 23 when there's a comma but that but you get in the greek and this is this will really preach this is really this will be really exciting <laughs> greek that preaches but 23, this man, and then, you know, then Peter goes on what you did and then, but it outside the law, but then there's a comma and then there's a whom, right? This man whom God raised up. And, and so it's that I like the, but, but it's not there, uh, <laughs> but that, but it, this man, you know, that demonstrative and then, and then, but this is what God, you know, this is what God did. And and God, God took this situation. And so I just think that that's really powerful, especially what you just said, Matt, and that, that we, that we really, uh, I think sometimes it, with the resurrection, it's so easy to focus just on Jesus and, and uh, Jesus was raised from the dead, but the was raised part, we don't, we don't focus on as much that this is, and what is this, what does this say about who God is, that this is what God does. This is who, this is God's agency. And this is revealing characteristics about, about who God, God chooses to be in the world and how God is in the world. And I think that's worth a sermon for sure. Psalm, anything about the Psalm? Uh, the Psalm, um, for me, um, uh, the second, uh, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Um, I think that that, that can be a refrain uh, for uh, uh, any of the texts that are read. Um, uh, Caroline's last statements uh, about acts, it would be the same thing as, as Matt has highlighted the actions of God. So that that second verse in, in the psalm would be a refrain for that. Uh, I'm, I have no good without you. Um, the end of Thomas's statement in John, you are my Lord and my God, and that refrain would work again. I have no good apart from you. And, and I believe that the same thing would be true uh, if we look at uh, First Peter in light of uh, what Caroline and Matt were, were lingering on in Acts in the same things that what is happening uh, to us, this new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is actually something that God the Father has done. And it's by the power of God that that has done. And so again, the Psalm becomes the refrain for that. We have no good apart from you. I like that. That's great. And it involves an inheritance uh, as well. And and the well, one of the one of the sad things about this lectionary choice is that it skips the first two verses of of the letter, which identifies the readers as exiles. And so, to think about uh, exiles, don't usually get much of an inheritance, <laughs> especially oh, in the ancient. He's an ex. What's that? He, I mean, he's in Peter. You're in Peter now. Okay, got it. Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. First Peter, chapter one. Yeah. I Joy we made the gonna... seamless transition from the psalm to First Peter, <laughs> so I just followed on her coattails. Oh, and... yeah. Okay, got it. First yeah. Peter is addressed to exiles, and then it talks about receiving an inheritance, which is there's a discontinuity there in a world where where inheritances are usually things like land and livestock. Exiles don't get an inheritance that's it's worth anything. And so there's 
uh, that's a dramatic move too to think about that'll pull you a lot deeper into the whole rhetoric of first peter if you if you want to follow this for several weeks i think it's all the sundays of easter six weeks yeah. six week sermon possibility yeah but if that's I, what you choose to do we're here for you we are but i think uh i think you know the one of the things that we've talked about for this podcast, you know, one of the verses from the Psalm, you show me the path of life, not you, you know, the the resurrection is not you showed me, but the resurrection is you show me uh, that, that present and future reality of the resurrection. And, and then that, and that by his great mercy in verse three, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it offers that, First Peter offers this new sort of, or a different uh, way of thinking about what does resurrection mean? How, when do we think of resurrection as a new birth into a living hope? Uh, and what does it mean? Yeah. To, to kind of embody that new birth uh, and uh, going forward as, as believers. So that's uh, another, another way to capture if we even possibly can or can't meaning of the resurrection. Yeah, I um, I um, just had a conversation with a couple of students about um, what do we do with this idea of new birth and and um, what what do we mean by born again was actually the question, and um, and maybe it was because I was thinking about this text, but this text and the way that you just lifted it up, Caroline, actually, cha- new birth is about a changed perspective a perspective that now we can have a living hope because of the rumors of the resurrection. Uh, and, and so new birth is not so much uh, this claim that we've made about are you born again, but it is evident in having this new hope, this living hope. <laughs>